give us, here we go. So we'll, good evening, everyone. This is Chris Sapienza. I am moderating the educational event with Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris. What we're doing right now is we're just opening the doors to the webinar. We want to allow all the participants a little bit of time to log on. We have quite a bit of interest in Dr. Martin Harris's talk this evening. So if you just give it another minute or so, we will get started. Dr. Martin Harris, it's like watching a ticker tape as the participants come through <laughs> to listen to you this evening. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Hi, Leslie Kessler, good to see you online here, although I can't see you in person. Gosh, I miss you. All right, folks, Dr. Chris Sapienza here. We're gonna get started this evening. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris with us this evening. Dr. Harris is going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll follow up with about 15 minutes of conversation, some uh, questions that will come in. Please type into the chat or the Q&A box so that I can receive those and, and help uh, generate and target those questions to Dr. Martin Harris when she completes her talk. We would spend about 28 minutes introducing her with regard to all of her talents and all of her accolades or publications, her scholarships and presentations, internationally well-renowned uh, speaker. Um, she has uh, had a long-standing career in South Carolina at the Medical University in South Carolina where she built her research and her program and her clinical acumen. Uh, she is also now working at Northwestern University. Bonnie has um, been honored with many different things. If you look at her title slide here, she's the Alice Gabriel Twight Professor, Roxelin and Richard Pepper, Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Radiation Oncology. So that means she has appointments in all of those different departments. Uh, the being named uh, after Philanthropic individuals uh, endowed means how special you are in terms of how people view your work. She's also the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs in the School of Communication. And always back to her roots, a clinical scientist, a clinician at the Edward Hines Junior VA Hospital. So Northwestern is very lucky to have you, Bonnie. We, we, you and I have been colleagues for such a long time. We're so interested in your your talk this evening. So I will turn the mic over to you and you'll see me fade away on video and I'll be back on in a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Sapienza, my longstanding friend. Chris Sapienza, we could talk for 30 minutes just about how we collaborated and met, but we won't do that. Um, I'm such, so honored to be here. I thank you, Chris for the invitation. I thank Aspire Respiratory Products for hosting this educational event. And thanks to all of you who are sacrificing your time at the end of the day to be here with us. Um, and by the way, Alice Gabriel Twight was the first woman who was granted a PhD from Northwestern. So that's very special uh, to me. So today I'm going to talk to you, you know, I, I, I kind of like to tell a story. So I'm gonna tell you a story about respiratory swallow relationships and it's going to be my story. So I hope that's okay. Um, the title of my talk is Biomechanical Impact of Respiratory Phase and Lung Volume um, and the Implications on Swallowing Assessment and Rehabilitation. These are my support and disclosures. Again, I'm always grateful for this stuff because it lets us do our work. Um, so I just, you know, why breathing and swallowing? It, it may seem obvious to you now, but when I started this work mm, back in the 90s, uh, people didn't really talk about breathing and swallowing relationships. You know, we were learning about swallowing and how it worked right here at Northwestern with Jerry Logeman. Um, but when I came to her as a PhD student and told her I was interested in breathing and swallowing, she just kind of looked at me. She thought it was interesting. She said, we're going to have to find people for you to work with because I don't know anything about it. And so that's what I did. 
Um, but the reason I went to Northwestern to study about these relationships is because I was a clinician for seven years. And during those seven years, a good part of it was at the VA hospital. And I saw a lot of patients with a diagnosis of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. And so, so why that group? Because they were being referred for swallowing assessments. And I could not figure out for the life of me why that patient population would have any issue with swallowing. You know, they didn't have a stroke. They didn't have cancer. So it intrigued me. And so I'm just going to talk about COPD a little bit because this is kind of how I got interested. So as you know, COPD is a common preventable and treatable disease. Um, it's characterized by persistent airflow limitation due to airway um, airflow restriction and alveolar abnormalities. Um, and it can be caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases, mostly, not always. So it's this combination typically of chronic bronchitis, chronic emphysema, and more recent literature also shows a contribution of asthma. So the airway themselves uh, narrowing like an asthmatic reaction. So it, it's the three combined um, and COPD is probably very underdiagnosed and it's diagnosed too late oftentimes. So there are a lot of people walking around with COPD who don't know it. 15 million Americans are diagnosed, um, 12 million underdiagnosed, it's estimated. 70% of COPD sufferers are in the workforce and COPD is now the second leading cause of disability in the US and the third leading cause of death. And of course, we've all heard in this age of this horrible pandemic that hopefully we're coming out of, um, uh, it, it, as a comorbidity, it was extremely life-threatening to those patients with COVID. Uh, the cost of care is very significant, over $50 billion a year. So it's really important to understand how, what comorbidities exist with COPD, what are identifiable and what might we be able to treat? And so I just you know, kept thinking about swallowing disorders, why breathing swallowing? So COPD um, is classified typically using this gold staging system or gold classification. Staging isn't used so much anymore. Um, and what it is is patients are classified via severity by force expiratory volume in a minute, FEV1 over FEC. Um, and you can see here the um, different classifications. It, COPD is multifactorial, uh, which makes it very difficult to work with these patients and figure out what's causing what. Um, there's alteration in oral pharyngeal and laryngeal sensation, disruption in coordinative processes between respiration and swallowing, which I'll talk about. This whole issue of air hunger, um, the work of breathing is so great that the work of eating and drinking and swallowing is put on top of that, adding to that air hunger um, at periods of exacerbation are problematic and that everything um, gets worse, including swallowing. Uh, then there's often an aging lung that goes along with it because many of the patients who are diagnosed with COPD are older. Um, these patients can often be malnourished and they could be very sick. So all of these complicating factors can contribute somehow to swallowing. The other thing to note is that, you know, there's muscle weakness involved as you saw in the lady's picture in the previous uh, uh, slide. You can see the muscle weakness and we, we think about respiratory muscle weakness with Dr. Sapienza can talk a lot about, but we, we also have to think about other striated muscles like muscles of the pharynx, muscles of the, pharyn of the pharynx and larynx, are they also involved in muscle wasting in this disease? And sometimes these patients have hyperinflated lungs because of air trapping. And we wonder about the mechanical effects of hyperinflation on swallowing, swallow safety and efficiency. So, you know, an example of this is a study that Bill Pearson did. And this is where we look at various structures um, at rest and at swallowing, and then again at rest and compare a normal healthy age group to patients with COPD. And what Bill found in a, a study that he did was that um, there were significant differences in patients with COPD 
in the position of the hyoid bone, the position of the larynx, um, and the uh, width of the pharynx. So all of these things you can imagine could potentially have an impact on swallowing function, but the issue is, you know, is it the COPD that's causing the swallowing uh, dysfunction or, or vice versa? Um, and of course, these patients have exacerbations. This is often when I would see them in the hospital because they'd be admitted. And, you know, at this point, there's further decline in lung function, poor quality of life, greater airway inflammation, high mortality with COPD exacerbation, and of course, greater risk of swallowing impairment and aspiration. So, I thought I was going to start by studying um, COPD when I went back for my PhD and when I realized how multifactorial it was, how heterogeneous the patient population was, and how little we knew about normal relationships between breathing and swallowing. I did the logical thing, I think, and started with normal breathing and swallowing physiology and how they're related. So we, we know that, that swallowing is a very complex uh, synergy of movements that protect the airway and clear the bolus uh, from the oral cavity, the pharyngeal cavity, and then the esophagus. And this all occurs in less than a minute. You all know this, you're experts, but don't let us never forget this complexity and simplify it to an oral phase, a pharyngeal phase, because it really undermines uh, the mechanism. And it's the, the, this mechanism is what you need to understand to properly diagnose and treat swallowing. And it's important to also understand swallowing is a continuum from mouth to stomach. It doesn't stop at the base of the neck. Um, we have an esophagus as well. Um, and in particular important because the esophagus goes through the thoracic cavity. So these relationships between you know, uh, pulmonary function, esophageal function, pharyngeal laryngeal function are really important to appreciate when you're standing before a patient uh, with, in a swallowing assessment. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the coordination between these two uh, very complex systems. And this, this complexity starts at the level of neural control, um, at the level of the brainstem at a very basic level. So uh, we're talking about structures in the medulla and in the pons that are the central controllers of breathing and swallowing. They're very close to one another um, in proximity. They, in, they have interneuronal connections between the centers. And some people, uh, neurophysiologists, have even isolated multifunctional neurons, that is a single neuron that's, that seems to be active in the control of both respiration and swallowing. So it's highly complex, there's still a lot we don't know, but it's really nice to see, um, I think about Dr. Gordon's work in Florida and the people he pulls together who are looking at this again, because there was a time when people weren't looking at breathing and swallowing, uh, it was just one or the other. Um, also at the level of uh, the cortex and subcortical centers, there is, uh, they play a role in the command of breathing and swallowing and also in the um, modulation of, of both behaviors. So what do we know? So uh, what we've done over the years is we have used both endoscopic and videofluoroscopic. So two methods, uh, two methods that are complementary but different in terms of the questions that they're able to answer. So I used endoscopy when I was uh, interested in laryngeal respiratory relationships prior to and after the swallow. And I used video fluoroscopy when I was interested in what happens from mouth to stomach relative to respiratory movement and airflow. Uh, so we did a series of experiments in my lab and others and in our early work with video fluoroscopy, we found that uh, in general for liquid swallows, most healthy individuals, uh, non-dysphagic adults, uh, swallowed during the expiratory phase of the respiratory um, cycle. And in the majority of these patients, there was a small airflow at the end of a swallow, um, expiratory airflow. 
And what we also found by looking at uh, breathing and swallowing together using video fluoroscopy and techniques such as inducted plasmography, which I'll show you in a little bit, and nasal airflow measures, uh, for example, we could define the coordination of these two events, um, how they occur in time. And what we found was that things are so tight, the onset of all the swallow events are so, so tight relative to the onset of um, uh, it, it, the things that are occurring in the oral cavity, the pharyngeal cavity, and the larynx, et cetera, that we almost have a straight line. So people think of swallowing as this sequence, but really the motions are on top of one another. What was very interesting to me is that even though we found that respiratory cessation, stop, you stop breathing, was obligatory at the onset of pharyngeal swallowing, which is essentially right here. The, the actual onset or respiratory inhibition, if you will, was variable in healthy adults, meaning that if you look at these circles and each one of them represents a different patient, there's a lot of variability at the time they stopped breathing uh, when they were initiating swallowing. And in fact, a lot of people stopped breathing when they were put, bringing the cup to their mouth. So given the fact that this is also tight and that for sure, by the time the um, pharyngeal swallow initiated, they stopped breathing, I, I thought to myself, if there's variability, and as a clinician, I know if there's variability, what that tells me about behavior is potentially that behavior could be changed. So I remember thinking about this at the time, I put that knowledge in my back pocket and didn't think about it for a while and kept going with this line of research. We came up with a model about how respiratory swallow coordination works using these two modalities, as you can see here, very tight, usually swallow occurred during expiration, swallowing is imposed on breathing, there is essentially respiratory inhibition. And then in most patients, there was a small amount of expiratory airflow at the end of the swallow, most of the time as the larynx was descending and opening. When we looked at this with endoscopy, what we could see is that I, I have a little sort of schematic here, you know, the vocal folds uh, themselves, you would see, um, Oops, sorry. Ah, you would see inspiration as the vocal fold slightly abducted. You see expiration as they come to a more paramedian position, inhalation, exp expiration, and you'd see this undulating movement of the vocal folds. And of course, this had been described in the literature way before me. But what was so interesting, because we were looking at swallowing and breathing, what we found is that the vocal folds come to this paramedian position during expiration. And that's the set point for when pharyngeal swallow occurred. So you were in this good physiologic space, if you will, to then go on and protect your airway um, and transit bolus through your pharynx, a space that's shared by both breathing and swallowing. Then uh, later in my career, I paired up with this fellow, Dave McFarlane, and David and I, we, he was in Canada, I was in the United States, and you know, we, we read one another's work, and, and the funny thing, we talk about it now, neither one of us really believed one another's work, and, and the reason for that is our, our findings were somewhat disparate. And then we, we figured out that, you know, David was primarily studying uh, chewing and mastication and how uh, mastication is integrated into eating and swallowing and breathing mostly. And uh, because he was looking at neural control, et cetera. And what he found in a lot of his studies was that swallowing occurred um, at end expiration. Uh, and with the work that we were doing with liquids, we were finding it was more at a mid-level of expiration. So we kind of got together. We did a study um, together looking at healthy people. And what we found in our work and in David's work later at, is that most of our patients in our studies, our people in our studies, 
not only initiated swallowing during the expiratory phase of respiration, but the majority of them, um, when you use cal uh, cap we used calibration methods that were longstanding in the literature, we found that most um, patients initiated swallowing during mid to low lung volume. So not high lung volume and certainly within tidal volume range. So not up here at, you know, like total lung capacity. They, their swallowing occurs in this um, tidal volume range of the respiratory cycle, typically during expiration at mid to low lung volume. And we've showed this time and again. There are some differences in this uh, volume range with liquids versus solids versus semi-solids, um, and but but minimal, still within tidal volume, and also uncued versus cued. So when we told individuals when to swallow in the in in the expiratory cycle, they they were in this sort of mid to low range. When we didn't cue them, they were they were up here. So again, I I kept thinking about these you know, the fact that the onset of respiratory cessation, we used to call it apnea, um, was highly variable in healthy people. And that if we cued them, we could actually get them in this, what we're gonna call it a sweet spot range. And I'm gonna tell you why, based on our scientific premise, that we could maybe train people to do this. So the, my premise is that the respiratory phase in which swallowing is initiated influences the biomechanics necessary for airway protection and efficient food and liquid clearance through the pharynx and potentially the esophagus. Um, so if we look at our data, uh, what we find is that in inspiration, the tongue moves slightly forward, uh, the pharynx widens, right, and the larynx descends. The larynx descends because the diaphragm contracts and the, you know, the, the lungs are connected to the trachea. The trachea is connected to your larynx. And when you inhale, everything goes down. When you swallow, everything has to go up. So this is a position that you're in when you inhale, as you can see here. When you exhale, you see um, a much more... Uh, how do I say, positive physiologic environment to initiate a swallow because the tongue, the, the positioning of the tongue is somewhat posterior. And, and remember that uh, the tongue base retracts to generate positive pressure on the bolus, right? Here it's forward during inspiration because you want a patent airway. Um, here it's slightly back. The larynx itself is at a more neutral position during expiration, so not, not pulled down. Um, and the pharynx is no longer widened. It, it is in a more neutral, narrow position. So what we propose is that this creates an efficient set point for swallowing movements necessary to protect your airway and transfer the bolus efficiently through the um, uh, pharynx and esophagus. So. We did all this work in normals. We published a lot of this work and I was doing a project and I remember it was Marty Brodsky who is now at Johns Hopkins University, all grown up and an associate professor, but at the time was a pre-doc in my lab. And one of the uh, head and neck surgeons was um, doing a study in, on oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer patients. It was a quality of life issue. I can't remember exactly what the primary premise of the study was, but Marty, like Marty Wood and Bonnie said, well, why not measure their, look at their breathing um, and swallowing, and we'll, we'll hook them up to all the respiratory acquisition um, equipment and see what we find. Well, I why not? So we did, and um, it, was, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> you fall upon these things in your career, and what we found was that in a group of head and neck cancer patients. Uh, these were, there were uh, N of 40 what, that we looked at. We had 20 patients, 20 controls. And the 20 patients were primarily oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer. They um, had uh, equal number of the patients were treated with um, surgery and radiation and chemo radiation. Small sample, right? Cohort study, we just looked at them. and. 
we were only looking at liquid swallows. And it was kind of amazing to us that we found that the head and neck cancer patient had altered phase patterning, um, including an inconsistent pattern or an unstable pattern. And we called it, and I put in parentheses, non-optimal. Um, still, this is very preliminary work. And then um, what we found was the patients who had this non-optimal pattern, where we called it, uh, had significant increases in the severity of uh, penetration aspiration using the PAS scale and using and uh, physiologic impairment using the modified barium swallow impairment profile. So this we found this to be quite interesting. We actually published this paper. And what happened with this paper is it springboarded into two other studies. Um, oropharyngeal head and neck cancer. So now I've shifted from COPD to oropharyngeal head and neck cancer. But as you all, many of you know, COPD is, an, is often a comorbidity in head and neck cancer. Although oropharyngeal head and neck cancer is a bit different, as you know. This is um, almost an epidemic. I mean, in worldwide, there are 350 to 400 thousand people diagnosed each year, nearly 10% in the US alone. And the, while most head and neck cancers are decreasing um, in, uh, in incidence in the country, oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer worldwide, including the United States is increasing. And this is because of the relationship between the uh, human papilloma virus and oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer. It impacts younger people, um, otherwise healthy people, um, oftentimes non-drinking, non-smoking, which was the classic, you know, um, uh, factors, risk factors associated with head and neck cancer. So we see people coming to tumor board now in their 40s, sometimes 30s. Uh, it's quite alarming. So, but the thing about um, HBV-related oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer is they have a good response to their cancer treatment in terms of cure. However, the treatments themselves can either result in acute uh, and pretty severe, off, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, uh, swallowing problems, and um, if not acute, uh, sometimes later. So we have this late effect of radiation that can be devastating. And our friends at MD Anderson, Kate Hutchison has written a lot about this, about late effects of radiation. The traditional therapy for oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer, I mean, we've, we've come a long way. I, I wish we were further along when I look at my career, you know, 30 years. Uh, we still have a, a lot of limitations into what we can do for this patient population. You know, we do dietary modifications, compensatory strategies, and mostly try and improve strength, range, we're not really sure what we're targeting, and skill or precision of movement, timing of movement. Many times these treatment protocols are not standard. We're not, they, even though we want to personalize care, we should have standard protocols that we use. Um, they haven't resulted in real substantive or durable improvements. And they don't consider respiratory swallow patterning or respiratory swallow coordination relationships in their application. And when you think of a lot of the compensatory strategies and maneuvers we impose on respiration in these swallowing maneuvers, supraglottic swallow, effortful swallow, et cetera, we are significantly manipulating respiration and potentially breathing and swallowing relationships. So what we did is based on that uh, first study, we did uh, two studies, one was at the VA, one was at the Medical University of, of South Carolina. And we looked at uh, a group of head and neck cancer patients. And what we thought we would try is if a patient had this discoordination or inconsistent patterning that we would anticipate in healthy non-dysphagic patients, could we potentially train them to initiate respiratory inhibition or respiratory cessation at this point uh, in the expiratory cycle at mid to low lung volume. And so we set out, we divide, uh, we set an initial trial and we did this. And what we did was we, um, we looked at, I'll tell you what our training was and then our primary outcome measures for this training were uh, physiologic scores. So MBSIMP, 
PAS scores and quality of life scores and MD Anderson dysphagia inventory. So the patients, as you can see here, are hooked up to the uh, respiratory kinematic data acquisition, and these are inductance coils and these bands, and this uh, these signals are then digitized. Here we are at the computer, and we synchronized the respiratory signal, respiratory kinematic, and respiratory flow with video fluoroscopy. So we did an initial assessment. We we uh, describe their swallowing, we describe the respiratory swallow coordination, and if they met uh, threshold or criteria for inclusion, we brought them into the study and we trained them to coordinate breathing with swallowing. And we had three phases. There was an identification phase. This is a, a hierarchical uh, uh, paradigm of motor learning where you identify, you acquire the skill, you learn to do the skill itself, and then uh, you use visual feedback, then you take the feedback away and you are able to master the task um, without visually uh, aided feedback. So this is what we did. I, I won't go into all of it. I can address questions and I'll show you some of the recent work. But putting a patient through this training that only at, the, at maximum was six, six sessions, um, we found at the end of the day that these patients had um, not only mastered the ability to initiate their swallowing during the expiratory phase of respiration, they also had significant in, uh, improvements in laryngeal vestibular closure, tongue base retraction, and pharyngeal residue. So think about the premise that I showed you in the beginning about laryngeal vestibular closure. You know, that neutral, nice neutral position of the larynx during expiration, tongue base retraction. Uh, the tongue is slightly back, not forward as it is an in inspiration. Pharyngeal residue, well, you would think that phary pharyngeal residue would be related to tongue base retraction, right? Because we know that this is a, a pretty important pressure generator to clear the pharynx. We also found significant increases, uh, well, improvements in the PAS scores. All of this was really a surprise. I you know, you go into these things, you're never sure what you're going to get, I, especially in an exploratory study, um, because we didn't have data to power this study uh, like we do now. And, you know, I thought we might make patients worse by trying to manipulate their breathing and swallowing. We weren't sure, but we didn't. And their, um, even their MDADI scores improved, even though they weren't clinically significant, they were statistically significant. Here's an example of a patient, a pre-training and post-training sample. So you can see head, neck cancer patient here. On the patient on your left, you're gonna see uh, pharyngeal residue. You're gonna see incomplete laryngeal uh, closure and aspiration. And in the after the training, you're gonna see improved tongue base retraction. You're gonna see improved laryngeal vestibular closure and you're gonna see improved pharyngeal clearance and no aspiration. So. This is an example of one of the patients from that study. So our preliminary findings support that respiratory swallow training is a skill-based therapy that recalibrates respiratory swallow coordination. Performance is improved with practice, which is evidence that motor learning is taking place. And RST results in improvement in mechanical and airway protective mechanisms in patients treated for persistent uh, oral pharyngeal head and neck cancer. I should have said that, but these were patients in this trial with longstanding um, uh, problems. So they were all at least six months post-treatment, head and neck cancer treatment. But this, you know, this was, again, we didn't have a control group and that's certainly a limitation of the study. So it took us to another, another uh, trial. Um, but anyway, so again, breathing's imposed, uh, swallowing's imposed on breathing, swallowing is driven by positive pressure generation, expiration is a positive pressure flow phenomena, synchronized with the initiation of swallowing, and training swallowing during expiration facilitates a physiologically advantageous environment for airway protection and bolus clearance. We published this work, uh, you're welcome to read all this stuff. And then we um, also have an, a study that one of my doctoral students now, an assistant professor at MUSC, oh my gosh, we, you know, borrow from one another, uh, Terry Wasabi published, published an article in Head and Neck 
where she looked at a pre-treatment cohort and a post-treatment cohort, further showing the relevance of respiratory swallow coordination um, on patients who were treated for head and neck cancer. So in patients who were pre-cancer, they had um, a higher frequency of swallow initiation during expiration compared to a post-treatment cohort. Um, their pharyngeal scores uh, were lower, their pharyngeal total scores were lower pre-treatment uh, at relative to post-treatment, um, which we would probably expect. Um, and the patients who had higher, uh, which is worse, pharyngeal total scores also had um, a greater frequency of sort of this, what we're calling non-optimal respiratory swallow phase patterning. So, you know, and then another uh, postdoc of mine, Brittany Kreckler, did a study where uh, she presented at DRS. And what she found was that, you know, you know, she looked at timing and she looked at what might be changing. And so what she found is a, um, a, a, that, that there were differences in timing and that, the, that these differences in timing facilitated um, uh, an improved tongue base retraction, laryngeal vestibular closure decreased PAS and decreased pharyngeal residue. So there was a correlation to the onset of events with these improvements. So we have a current ongoing trial at the VA and now we do have a control group. Patients are randomized um, and we wanna look at the benefits of respiratory swallow training on eating, drinking, health and quality of life. This is the third year of the study. We have an experimental group, a control group, and then a home practice group that's not randomized. This is a randomized controlled study. Um, I won't go through all of it, but just, I want you to understand the rigor that's associated with this kind of work. You don't just slap these, you know, bands on people and say, oh, you know, we're gonna do this and train these people and oh, it works. So it, it takes a lot. So we did a pilot, we did a preliminary, and now this is a randomized clinical trial. Uh, you can see that our hardware and software has been perfected. Um, and this is um, uh, a, a new display that you see. This is an example of, this isn't real, this is my student. Uh, uh, the patient looking at visually guided feedback. And so what's next? I just wanted to show you, we, we just started, we are just starting, and I'm very happy to say a new R01, and this is funded by um, NCI. And now instead of looking at chronic dysphagia, we're looking at subacute. So this three to six month window, we're gonna get them earlier. And uh, this is our team. And we, uh, we have 88 uh, subjects that we're going to put into a, sh a randomized sham control trial, which is going to be fun this time. And we are looking again at the relevance of respiratory phase on uh, the swallow physiology, airway protection. We have an experimental group, a sham group, but I wanna kind of get to the end. Uh, here you can see what our primary endpoints are gonna be, our secondary endpoints. I don't wanna go too much over time here. Um, and our hypothesis is that the experimental group will increase frequency of swallows initiated during expiration, improve airway protection compared to group two. This is the fun part. So what we, I'm so fortunate, not Chala Kantarsajil came from Purdue and, Chala, and Georgia, Malandraki's lab, Chala is a postdoc. And we are working with John Rogers and his big group in engineering. And they have developed a wearable sensor. And what this sensor is allowing us to do now in this trial <clears throat> is real-time process a respiratory signal and a swallow signal in the same sensor um, so that our patients can be trained remotely with a wearable sensor. Um, is my mom. Um, and so here she is, you know, uh, and she can look at her breathing and swallowing. And uh, what this has done is it's all done in a telehealth platform. And aim two in this study is examining respiratory swallow coordination during wakeful hours because they can wear this sensor for an unlimited amount of time. And um, all they have to do is put it on a battery charger. So I think what I'm gonna do, I won't go through this whole study, but just thank all the wonderful people in my lab and, um, and thank all of you. I'll stop. Wow. 
<laughs> okay, so half hour is not enough, obviously. So we're gonna we're definitely uh, we'll ask Aspire Products if we can have you back. But um, I wanna I wanna ask. Uh, fascinating the sensor, obviously, as a as a speech pathology nerd, along with uh, everyone that's probably on the line. We want to hear more about that before you leave. But somebody asked, you know, can you give it in a in a quick synopsis? The actual training paradigm, you've got some great outcomes. What is the person sitting through prior to the sensor? What were you actually doing? So prior to the sensor, they we start off with just looking at visual displays of breathing and swallowing. And so the, the patient just, we say, okay, show us inspiration, show us expiration, show us the swallow. So they're just pointing. And so they have to get a certain accuracy level. And once they meet that goal, there are 12 goals in this whole program. Once they meet the goal, then they go to the next thing. The next thing is looking at a computer screen and doing the same thing. Then we hook them up to the respiratory um, equipment and then they do the same thing. They identify uh, using their own pattern, breathing, uh, what's inhalation, what's exhalation, what's a swallow look like. Then what they do is they learn to match a model and swallow during expiration. Uh, that's a lot. And then what we do is we take the visual display away. We can see what they're doing and we're recording it, of course, and then they do it on their own. And then that's it. And then we um, do a post uh, video fluoroscopy with the equipment on so we can see if there are any changes in their pattern with their swallowing. We evaluate both. And then we bring them back one month, three months, and look if there's any deep training or um, if there are any, you know, if, if it's stable, if the if the uh, if it's a durable treatment. But the burning question, right, from the clinician's perspective, is I don't have that technology, yeah. Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know, you know, I can't do all this. So, can you translate now where yeah. you are with the sensor and and or a protocol that the everyday clinician can utilize based on? Because with anything's important to to the two of us is evidence-based and you demonstrated that today, right? That the techniques we are advocating for clinicians to use have evidence based behind them. So you have that evidence based in this, you know, amazing presentation. How does a clinician adopt it? Where's the sensor? When's it coming out? Uh, you know, as an intellectual property development. Um, but even if the sensor is not out, step one, how do I translate what you did with the inductive plasmography to everyday clinical yeah. treatment? And that piece of equipment has been around since I was doing my dissertation and there, ha there haven't been anything really so great um, that you can combat, uh, calibrate lung volume and all this stuff that we have to do. As a clinician, you're never gonna carry all that stuff around. This is why we're so excited about the sensor because you, we get rid of all of that. We don't even use that in the training. We are just using the sensor. We'll do it, you know, at the beginning and at the end of the training, but not during it. So we're very excited about that. Can you do anything? I don't know when the sensor is actually going to be out. I don't have a lot of control over that, but, um, you know, it's, it's be, these sensors are being used everywhere. Everybody talks about sensors, right? The, the, yeah. the beauty of this is the real-time signal processing. Right, it's right. Very rare. And um, so I think it'll come sooner than we thought, uh, but you know, it could be a couple of years. So what do you do in the meantime? So I've actually been working with David and we've been coming up with some interim things we can do. There are some pieces of, of equipment that are out there that are much less invasive. Um, and some of them are nasal airflow. And you can, I, even though there are limitations to nasal airflow, it is a very stable signal. If your patient um, is, a, is breathing, can breathe through their nose, um, there are also some belts you can use. But I have to tell you, you know, I'm a, a clinician scientist. I can't write a grant like that and say, oh, you can just do this. It will never get funded. So we have to have the highest fidelity, right? Right. I have trained patients in the clinic tracing a wave with a pencil <laughs> on a sheet of paper where they're inhale, exhale. Yes, exhale. exactly. And you can hear, swallow. Yep. And you, and, know, and, you know, when I think about it, and, you know, you and I could talk about this at another time, but just the simple breathing in and out of a straw. 
and, and using that to phase the inspiration and expiration and then posture a swallow or utilizing, you know, the SM, SEMG, which are much less expensive, yeah. uh, you know, as a biofeedback tool. But, uh, you know, I think the, the piece of equipment you're coming up with, the sensor is going to be highly valuable. I, I said to people, people don't get this. You mentioned 30 years. No, um, 30. Not, no listen, 30 years oh, from the work. time you oh. started to the time now that you're able to bring your work into a translatable product. That was actually the same for expiratory muscle strength training. It took about 25 years for the literature to really become robust. And these things take time. So um, I, I think to go back to, to, to the, the thoughts to the audience are, you know, that swallow is a submaximal task. We don't need to be at high lung volumes right. and at low no. lung volumes, right? We need to be inside the tidal volume, which yeah. folks, folks, that's what you're doing right now. Yeah. You know, and we don't need to be trying to bring them up to high lung volumes or drive oh. them down. You're, you're actually, to, to Dr. Martin Harris's point, you're driving them outside the biomechanical, uh, you know, sort of yes. uh, perfect place where they should be. And- you know, Bonnie, the, the, the work on uh, EMST has shown, you know, that it helps the hyoid move up and, you know, close the, the, the glottal space. But, you know, maybe there'll be a time where in the, the COPD population, you know, is, the, is there, because it's a submaximal test, even a need yeah. to, to use stronger respiratory strength training techniques for these patients? Or do you feel that that might not be the case? But the funny thing about this, I, I is the, I think what we're trying to do is normalize the environment. When I think about what does reduce the load as much as possible and right. make it a more natural thing, patients do all kinds of strange things. I mean, think about what we train them to do: superglottic swallow. What was the first thing we used to tell them to do? Take a Big breath in, try and try and swallow after taking a big breath in. It's totally physiologically adverse to what a swallow needs. So I think part of what we're doing is just normalizing right. nice, yeah, and, and not overloading them with a big cognitive burden, a big strength kind of training burden. Not that those things are bad, but I think that that has something to do with why this seems to work is that it normalizes the environment for the patients and they learn it. Um, even patients who are minimally cognitively impaired. So. And that, that's really important. And, and I think that the strength only comes in the need for that is when your patient is so weak, yeah, you know, that they can't yeah. get the, 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 the laryngeal respiratory system biomechanically primed, right, to right. In, engage in, in the swallow. But um, exactly right. congratulations so much on the funding um, from the VA. Where, where can we hear you speak next? Uh, the audience, uh, you obviously have, a, have a, a fan club here. Where, where are you heading to next on your virtual tour of presentation? Oh, my gosh. My <laughs> I'll be at ASHA. So you're going to oh, good. be there in person. So yeah, so I can, I'll see people there. I don't have anything in October, but we've had Japan, we've had Brazil. There's been a lot in this in fall, but I have a little break. This is the first week of classes at Northwestern. So I kind of have my hands full. Um, you can see our beautiful view out my window and yeah. Well, so one of the top, that. one of the top schools in the country with one of the top researchers in our field, Dr. Bonnie Martin Harris. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Chris, you, thank so you so much. much. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye.